Good morning. And welcome to First Presbyterian Church on this rainy day. I was thinking we would have a smaller crowd today, but I was wrong. So thank for good job for being here, everyone. Uh, I have a few announcements. One is that we have a, a takeaway hunger event happening in Linville on November 6th. And anyone wishing to help feed the hungry in Iowa, uh, it says John Taylor, but he's not here, so I suggest you give him a call. Uh, also, uh, we will be worshiping in Fellowship Hall for the next couple Sundays. Uh, you might have noticed things are a little different in here. We're, uh, scaffolding will be moving in tomorrow to uh, paint the ceiling, so we'll be out of the out of the sanctuary for a couple Sundays, so join us downstairs next week. And finally, um, the stewardship letters are ready to go. Uh, we invite you to help us with our stewardship of saving money on postage by taking yours uh, as you leave today so that we don't have to mail it to you. And that is all I have for announcements. Friends, let us prepare our hearts for worship.
And, and some of them are behind us. That's not, that's not how it usually is, huh? Now, we have some, some, some stuff going on, because I don't know if you've ever noticed. Have you ever noticed that the paint on our ceiling is kind of falling off? Well, we are very happy to say that starting tomorrow, we're going to start working on that. And the next time we worship together in here, that ceiling is going to be all freshly painted with no, nothing falling off. We both, right? <laughs> and we have a word for that, okay? We have a word for that in the church. We call that stewardship. And I made an announcement about stewardship. And part of stewardship is, you know, are you familiar with that word at all? That's kind of a weird churchy word, right? Stewardship, in the sense that I said that we have letters for you, that's every year we ask our church family how much of everything that God has given you, how much are you going to give back to the church so that we can do things like paint our ceilings and, and pay for the heat in the building and take care of everything that, that you have to do in the church. But also, that also means stewardship is just taking care of, oh, you got your shoes back. <laughs> that was fast. Goodness. Stewardship also means taking care of what God has given us. So we as a church take care of the building. And we as a church take care of, what other, what other things do we take care of? As a church or as people in the world? Anything else? You take care of the world. Is that what you said? <laughs> that is an excellent answer. Yeah, we take care of the world. We take, take care of other people. We take care of the earth. There's so much to take care of because God gives us so much. Okay, well, thank you all for being up here. It's so good to see you. Let's stand and I pray with you. Dear God, we thank you for all the many gifts you give us and for the opportunities to take care of the things in our world, including our church and the very world itself. God, we pray that you would continue to use us as instruments for your peace and good and love in the world. Amen. Friends, you are God's beloved child. With you, you, God is loved. Thanks for coming out. <laughs> Just in case you don't recognize the words to this song, I want to read them to you. They're from the book of Philippians. And um, it strikes me that um, Paul says in the introduction to this letter to the Philippians that he's writing it from prison. And there's a long history of Christians writing letters from prison. You think of Martin Luther King, you think of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and here's Paul. And I'll just read the lyrics of this song. Do all things without murmuring and arguing, so that you may be blameless and innocent children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, in which you shine like the stars in the world. 
Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Finally, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things.
that your word may show us the blessings you intend for all creation. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Our journey through the Bible in a year brings us this week to our only Sunday in the Gospel of Mark, the shortest of the four Gospels. Indeed, due to its brevity and the fact that almost all of Mark is contained within the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, it was once thought that Mark was an abbreviated version, an abridged version of Matthew. But biblical scholars have come to believe that Mark is actually the oldest of the Gospels, and that the authors of Mark and Luke used Mark, I mean, of Matthew and Luke used Mark as their primary source. For those who have read Matthew and Mark back to back, either now or at some other time, you might have been struck with how fast things happen in Mark. Matthew seems like a long, lingering stroll through the woods compared to Mark's speeding freight train of one episode after another and the frequent use of the words immediately and then. Though well aware of these differences between the two Gospels and the relative rapid pace of Mark, when reading this back-to-back, -back, probably for the first time, I felt like I had to fasten on my seatbelt and hold on to my hat. It was moving so fast. So when faced with only one Sunday to preach from the Gospel of Mark, one of my top two favorite Gospels, how do I choose? Well, it was rather simple, actually. This is the one Sunday of our entire year that the scripture assigned in the Revised Common Lectionary that I usually preach from actually lines up with the scriptures assigned for reading through the Bible in a year. So we come to this healing story from Mark, this healing story as described from the point of view of a bystander that day. You couldn't blame him, really for being a beggar. After all, he was blind. What else could he do? He couldn't work for a living, and even if he was able to find some kind of labor, who would hire him? No, this blind man, this Bartimaeus, as we later learned he was called, had no friends, no family. He had no other choice but to beg. He had no option but to rely on the scarce generosity of strangers. It must have been a terrible way to live. People always passing by, probably abusing debtors like Bartimaeus just for sport. Take his money, maybe kick him or hit him for no other reason than because they could. Because they knew that no harm would come to them. Beggars were barely considered human after all. And even most people who did give to beggars weren't particularly kind. A beggar like Bartimaeus could spread his cloak, spread it out to collect whatever people might toss at him, and the best he could hope for would be for a passerby to toss a small coin. I suppose the next best hope for it would be for people to simply ignore him, to be left alone. And of course, the worst, well, I already told you about that, the abuse. But no one, and I mean, no one would actually talk to someone like Bartimaeus. At least not in any kind of way. Maybe they'd yell at him if they thought he was in the way, or if they were angry at him, or just angry at the world, or maybe if they were just downright mean. But no one would just sit down with him and have a conversation with him as if he were an actual human being, a child of God made in God's image. Because it never would have occurred to anyone that he was a child of God, made in God's image. His blindness was considered God's judgment against him for either his own sinful nature or perhaps that of his parents. That's what we thought. We thought that someone was to blame for his sorry state if God was punishing him. And who were we to go against God's judgment? Plus, 
wouldn't want to get that close to someone like that for fear that it would somehow rub off on me. As we were leaving Jericho that day, Jesus, his disciples, and the rest of us followers and onlookers, Bartimaeus had heard all about it. He had, heard, had been hearing about Jesus in the days and weeks leading up to them, up to that day. It's amazing how much you can overhear sitting at the side of the road when you're practically invisible to those passing by. Bartimaeus had heard about Jesus' healings and teachings. He had heard about Jesus befriending the friendless, the sinner, the outcast. And Bartimaeus knew that he had nothing to lose. His situation could not possibly get in the least bit worse. And so... And so he shouted out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I was very close to him when he first shouted out, and it really made me jump. When I got over that first bit of being startled, I admit, I admit, I was irritated. Who did this blind beggar think he was shouting out to Jesus, making a fool out of himself, trying to force Jesus to pay attention to him? As if Jesus didn't have anything more important to do than to acknowledge some blind beggar. And why did he call Jesus son of David anyway? No one called him that. Sure, we had our suspicions, we had our hopes that Jesus was the Messiah, which would, in fact, make him the son of David, but, but no one actually ever called him that. But what did he mean by have mercy on me? It was lunacy, I thought. Perhaps blindness wasn't his only affliction. So I, along with many others in the crowd who were closest to Bartimaeus, sternly ordered him to be quiet while those closest to Jesus drew him closer as if to protect him from that crazy blind man. But the more we tried to quiet him down, the louder he got. And louder he shouted until Jesus just stopped. He just stopped in his tracks. And he called Bartimaeus to him. And so we all started to call Bartimaeus to Jesus as if, as if suddenly Bartimaeus was our good old friend that we've been trying to encourage all along. It's funny how fickle people can be, especially in crowds. Someone said, take heart, get up, he's calling you. But they really need to have said it. Bartimaeus had already taken part. He had already jumped up, throwing off his cloak. The cloak was his only worldly possession, the tool of his trade. And he tossed it aside like it was nothing. And in one fell swoop, the cloak flew off, scattering coins on the road. And Bartimaeus was halfway to Jesus. People made way for him and helped guide him towards Jesus. But it was still remarkable how quickly and easily he made his way to Jesus, considering he couldn't even see. And then he got to Jesus, and Jesus simply asked, what is it you want me to do for you? And Bartimaeus said, hey, my teacher, let me see again. Now, I had seen Jesus perform miracles before. I have even seen him make a blind man see before. That time, Jesus put some saliva on the man's eyes, and it actually didn't work at first. He had to do it a second time before the man's sight was restored. But this time, this time Jesus said, Go. Your faith has made you well. And I'll never forget what happened next. You can almost see the vision returning to Bartimaeus. You can see it in his eyes. You can see it in his face. And what was the first thing he saw? Well, it wasn't a thing at all. It was Jesus. After years of blindness, Bartimaeus had faith that Jesus would make him whole. And the first vision he had was of Jesus. Went from being 
being blind Bartimaeus the better, to Bartimaeus, follower of Jesus, friend of Jesus, disciple of Jesus, Bartimaeus made whole by faith. I think about Bartimaeus a lot, and I wonder if my faith is nearly as strong as his was before the healing. I know I'm not half the disciple of his. I think about Bartimaeus' simple declaration of faith, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I think about Jesus' simple question, what do you want me to do for you? It was the same question Jesus had recently posed to James and John when, when they asked Jesus to grant them everything they asked for. And James and John were seeking glory to sit at the right hand of Jesus when he comes into his glory. But Bartimaeus was not after the Lord. All, Jesus, all Bartimaeus wanted was for Jesus to have pity on him, to look upon him as a child of God. And being made whole meant much more than restoration of sight. Being made whole meant being restored to community. Bartimaeus instantly had community with his fellow followers of Jesus. Never again would Bartimaeus be scorned, abused, taken advantage of because of his blindness. Sometimes, Sometimes when following Jesus seems particularly difficult. And let's be honest, following Jesus can get rough. It is not always easy. It is rarely easy. But sometimes when I'm having a hard time, I think about Bartimaeus. And I think about his shouting out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And I repeat that to myself, either silently or sometimes even out loud. Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. I repeat it over and over until I hear the words come back to me. Take heart. Get up. He is calling me. And sometimes, every now and then, I even hear, go. Your faith is making whole. Take heart. Get up. He is calling you. Go. Your faith has made you whole. And seen, as we say in the theater. A couple weeks ago, in a gathering with other clergy, we read and responded to this scripture. And I admit, I was surprised to hear other pastors have negative reactions to this scripture. It bothers some because some people have, have others, loved ones in their lives with physical ailments, either visual or otherwise, that have not been cured. And it bothers them because they wonder, does, does this scripture imply that my loved one or I do not have enough faith? No, it means nothing of the sort. May Jean was one of my parishioners in Washington. She was a retired hospice nurse. And she often spoke of all the healing she would see in the lives of her hospice patients. They were not cured of the illnesses that would ultimately take their lives, but they found healing, spiritual healing, healing in their relationships, healing across families and communities. Twenty years ago, Dr. Danielle Oakery co-founded the Bellevue Literary Review out of the Manhattan Hospital, one of our country's oldest public hospitals, in an effort to promote healing, healing in all of its forms. And Dr. Offrey notes that literature and medicine share certain critical qualities, observation, precision, empathy. She says, you can go to the doctor and have your illness cured. That's different from being healed. Plenty of patients, I think, leave our offices, leave our hospitals, and their illness is cured. But they don't feel healed. 
Earlier this week, I was visiting with our friend Matt here. For any of you who don't know, Matt has a disability, having been born with cerebral palsy. And I read today's scripture to him this week, hoping that he would not find this scripture hurtful, as some of my clergy colleagues do. And I was all ready to explain to him about healing coming in different forms, and even though we all don't always get cured of our physical ailment, God is always able to heal us. So I read him the scriptures, and I asked him what he thought, and I kind of held my breath, and then Matt confidently proclaimed, I get healed all the time. He went on to say that when people visit him, whether it's the deacons or other friends or Zuzu or other dogs, he said that visiting with others somehow heals him. Wow. Matt gets what some of my seminary trained, seasoned pastor colleagues' friends do not. Matt gets it. Just as Bartimaeus' healing was just as much, if not more so, about being folded into the community, for Matt, relationships with others bring him healing. It is unfortunately true that healing is not always in the form of physical cure that we desire. But if we define healing in terms of well-being, well-being of our entire selves, our souls, our relationships, we can find healing through our relationship with our ever-present God. And if we find healing through our relationship with God, that healing can be expanded through our relationships with others. When we seek true healing, regardless of cure, we can find that healing occurs even under dire circumstances. Amen. Although I noticed that we don't have a space for the offertory in the bulletin, this is an important thing for us to do so we can stop and think about how we can use God. And so, though we're not yet ready to pass the offering plate down the queue, still we are called to give a portion of the gifts God has provided. Let us take this time to consider our commitments through our tithes and offerings or our time and our talents to support the ministry of this church family, our community, and the world. In gratitude for the immeasurable gift of Jesus Christ, may we give with an open heart to share Christ's reconciliation throughout the world. Seeing the bounty that God has made for our good use, let us give our tithes and offerings for the sake of the church and for the poor.
Christ, the love of God, and the power of Christ.